Because what could happen is that you can go to your spiritual guru, you could tell him, hey, I had the realization that I'm God, and your spiritual guru will tell you, no, you're not God, because let's say he was from the Buddhist tradition. And in the Buddhist tradition, they don't talk about God. They prefer to call it nothingness or emptiness. And so when you tell him, I realize that I'm God, and he tells you, no, you're not God, you're nothing, and you haven't realized nothingness yet, you don't realize yet that God and nothingness are actually one, um, but he doesn't realize it either, your guru, because he hasn't had the insight that he's God. But you as a student, you don't know these subtle distinctions, so you can get tricked by even gurus and teachers that are supposed to be helping you. It's important that you keep in mind that very few spiritual traditions and teachings teach you and explain in clear terms all of these different facets that I've laid out for you here. Many teachings are lopsided and tend to emphasize one facet over other facets. They tend to elevate one facet over other facets. You know, some teachings will emphasize the God. Other teachings will emphasize the love. Other teachings will just emphasize nothingness or emptiness. Other teachings will emphasize infinity. Other teachings will emphasize who knows what. And why is this? Because usually the people who create these teachings are not super well-rounded mystics. Usually they excel in one or the other. They have a preference for one or the other facet. Many times they haven't even realized half the facets. So they only go with what they got, the best they can do. They're doing the best they can do, but that's not always good enough. Oftentimes, they don't know what they're missing. See, it's rare that a teacher realizes all of these facets and integrates them all together in a clear manner and then teaches them all very clearly and explicitly to you. That's quite rare. Some people do it, but it's rare. Because oftentimes, people who awake, they awaken through some dogmatic narrow path, like they're a particular sect of Buddhist, or they're a particular adherent to some yogi path. You know, they follow some one particular yogi, and that's all they know. And they have not studied Buddhism, they have not studied Christianity, they have not studied Islam. That's all they know. So, when they awaken through only one narrow dogmatic path, that leads them to think that they're fully awake and that they've understood everything there is, but really, they haven't because they haven't studied all the teachings and they haven't gathered all the different facets. And their tradition probably didn't teach them all the different facets. And they probably weren't good enough at meditation and yoga and whatever else they were doing to gather all the facets independently by themselves, to discover them. Very few people actually discover spirituality independently. Most people just dogmatically walk some sort of path. They do some sort of narrow practice like meditation or prayer or contemplation or self-inquiry, and that's it. But they don't realize that you know, self-inquiry, it can awaken you, but it can also limit your awakening as well. So be careful assuming that your guru or teacher or teaching or the book you're reading is fully awake. That it's not missing any facets. Because you know what? Even the best teachers, I found that they often will not admit that they're missing a facet. When you confront them about some aspect of their teaching that you think might be lopsided or lacking, usually what you get from them is denial and ridicule and dismissal. They will dismiss your questioning of their teachings and their lopsidedness, they will dismiss it as your own ignorance. See, that's very easy for a guru or a teacher to do because they start to take it for granted that they have already fully awoken and there's nothing more for them to learn. Of course, this is just like another form of a, of a sort of spiritual closed-mindedness. They're resting on their laurels. You can go to a teacher and ask them about love. And if that teacher has never experienced love, he'll tell you that love is bullshit. That love is just a human emotion, and that it has nothing to do with awakening. Or you can go to a teacher and ask him about omniscience or about infinite intelligence, and they'll tell you, oh, 
forget about that. Just go and start, stop, uh, stop thinking about that and just go ask the question, who am I? See? That's because maybe they haven't realized what infinite intelligence is. And that doesn't mean they're not awake. They can be awake. But they can still not realize all the full nuances of the various facets that I've outlined for you here. And this difference between the different depths and also between the different facets becomes very apparent on psychedelics. Which is one of the reasons that psychedelics are such a powerful tool. Because different psychedelics allow you to hit awakening from different angles and perspectives. From different states of consciousness it allows you to have different insights than you normally would be able to do. This is very difficult to do if you're practicing only one narrow meditation technique or self-inquiry technique or some yoga technique. See? It becomes like one-dimensional. It's almost like you're playing a piano, but you've only been taught a few notes on one side of the keyboard. So you're, you're punching these notes here, but you don't even know how to move across to the other notes that you're missing. But psychedelics, especially if you're using a broad range of them, different ones like LSD, mushrooms, DMT, 5-MeO, DPT, whatever, you know, MDMA, they can all hit different facets and notes, and then you can, you can see the spectrum, you can see the mountain range that is awakening a lot better. That's one of their benefits. And some psychedelics are better at hitting certain notes than others. For example, MDMA hits that love note really well. Um... 5-MeO-DMT hits the God note really well. And, um, and, you know, it varies. It varies. That's a, that's a complex topic for another day. So, as you contemplate, as you meditate, as you self-inquire, as you do psychedelics, as you do yoga, whatever your practice is, it can be hard to predict which facet you're going to stumble upon next. It's somewhat random. It depends a lot also on what your intentions are. What do you want to know? What are you genuinely curious about the most? You might wonder, like, well, Leo, let's say I think that I'm missing the facet of absolute love, or I'm missing the facet of infinite intelligence. How do I target that particular one? And uh, here it's a little bit hit or miss, bit of a trial and error situation. I don't think there's a foolproof way, but if there was one way, I think the most important way would be through your intention. What is it that you genuinely want to know? What does your heart want to know about reality? See, why are you doing this work at all? Why are you questioning? Why are you pursuing this facet of love? Or why are you even interested in this facet of infinite intelligence? You have to really want to know. And for that, it's, it's helpful to have a question that you're latched onto as though your life depends on it. Like, for example, a question like, what am I? Or a question like, what is reality? Or a question like, what is God? Or what is love? Or why does anything exist? Or what is consciousness? Or why am I even here? What is the point of my life? What is the purpose of my life? These sorts of questions channel your mind via intention and will into some particular direction. You see? And it's not enough just to be pursuing one of these insights simply to check off a box. You have to really want to know it. Like there was a time in my life where I really needed to, to know what reality is. And then I got that desire answered because I cared about it so much. And then once that was answered, then I'm like, okay, I'm satisfied with that answer. Now I have a, but I have a different answer. Now I want to know like, what is God? And then that desire is satisfied. And then, so I get that one and they say, okay, well, now I understand God, but I still don't fully understand like, why is all of this here? And then I, I'm questioning that one, and then I get an insight into that one, and, and then finally I'm like, oh, okay, now I understand why it's all here. And then I'm like, well, but I still don't quite understand what's the connection between love and truth. I'm still murky on that. And so I, I question that the next time, and then I get an answer to that. And then I'm like, oh, okay, now I understand. Now I, I realize that 
Love and truth are actually two sides of one coin. Okay, that's clear. But then there's something else I'm confused about. And so this is how it's worked for me. And it probably, I assume, will work for you in a similar way.